So we always have to say we have nothing to disclose, except for I have to disclose about the face. Okay. Um, this is the face that what I see when I see an animated face. If you look at this face, it, it, it wants to make you smile. If you look at this face, all you see is teeth that are reflecting light to you, cheek mounts that are reflecting light, a squinting eye. Every part of that face is telling you I'm happy and be happy as well. So that's the picture I have in mind when someone comes with facial paralysis. That's the phase that we want to create for them. And I want to say we are far from being there, but that should always be our target. That should be what drives the innovations that we do. And I want to spend the next 30, 40 minutes talking to the steps that we are taking to try to get there. Now, the reason why we are not there is that this is a very complex process. And we always think about facial nerves because that's what we work with, facial muscles but there is a whole complex network, including the limbic system that injects emotion into the face. There is a disease that can happen, the type of um, vascular stroke, if you may say, that the patient's face will be droopy, but when you crack a joke and they, they laugh, they, the face moves, right? But if you tell them, smile, they can't smile, but you crack a joke and then it's, they will smile. Just tells you how complicated the network that moves the face is. So that's why when it's injured, we can't really, really reconstituted uh, and I'll talk to you about some steps that we're taking again to, to get, you look at these faces this is communicating all kinds of emotion this patient has bilateral paralysis it's, I'm t I, I asked him to smile when I took this picture but there's nothing coming out this is an angry face this is a very sad face we pay a lot of social pen penalties for it and we've proven with eye tracking studies that if your face is distorted when, some, when you interact with somebody, you can see the way their eye moves. It settles on the distorted portion of the face. The good thing is that we have current techniques that can actually normalize that eye, eye, distorted eye tracking um, 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 ch changes. But you have to go through this process in offering people the procedures that will allow them to get corrected in a very thoughtful manner. And that's what I want to share with you. In clinical practice, there are two main areas that we tend to focus on when someone has a paralyzed face. One is the eye, and one is the perioral region. So I can talk about the rest of the face, including breathing and, and speaking, but I will set, settle and focus only around the eye and around the mouth. Eye being being able to close your eyes and protect your cornea, and mouth being able to smile. Okay, With the eye, um, as you all know, the first thing that we always think about in a, in a person with Bell's palsy or any type of facial paralysis is protecting the eye. And you, you'll be surprised that in this century, we still use the old fashioned putting a lid on the eyelid to try to get the eye to close. And the, and the, and the first thing, we always <laughs> tell patients that we need the eye to close. And so we just put a weight on the eyelid and we measure it and we put it on and then the eye closes and then we think that's a, a, a solved problem. Um, but I would, I would propose to you that closing the eye is not as important as being able to blink. Because if the problem was just closing your eyes, you just walk around and tape your eyes. Right? There are people who can totally close their eyes but will still complain of having eye problems. The emphasis, I think, should be moving from being able to close your eyes to being able to effectively blink. Why? Because when you blink, you spread tears over your eyes, the eye becomes lubricated, it doesn't dry out. There are people who close their eyes very well, but they have dry eye syndrome. They make normal tears, but they have dry eye syndrome. So it's not really being able to close your eyes, but being able to effectively blink so you spread mu uh, uh, mucus over your eyes. So just taking this old uh, procedure that we commonly do, an eyelid weight, my thought was, why do we put weights with the, with the goal of closing the eyes? We should actually try to put weights in the eye with the goal of being able to improve the efficiency of someone's blink. The eye may not close completely, but if the blink is more efficient, the eye and cornea will be more protected. And in studies, this is what we've seen. As the weight you put on increases, it gets to a point that is optimal, and the blinking efficiency improves. And if, if you go beyond that weight, actually, blinking efficiency becomes worse. How did we do this study? Uh, we used this infrared video, and then we can load an eyelid of various weights on the eyelid, and then ask the patient to blink. And then we measure how much efficient the blink is, how much tears have been spread over the eye, 
how much coverage the, uh, the eye is uh, obtaining. And then once we get the precise weight, we say this is the weight that is ideal for this patient. This is the position that the weight should be placed in to get maximum contact tear distribution of the eye. So it's not a method of a matter of just put a weight and get the eye, eyelid to close, but pick a weight that will improve blink efficiency. This is some of the data that we get, so I can tell that with this particular weight, 80% of the um, cornea is protected versus 40% is protected, even when the eye is closing completely. And then use, using that criteria, we pick, we pick a weight. So a simple old procedure we always do can be adjusted to make it more efficient. I will tell you that I never almost put any weight higher than 1.2. Most of the time it's a 0 0.8 gram weight, very small, a 1.0 weight, very small. If I should go very high, it will be a 1.2. And we pick the location and the size based on these infrared studies. So that's a sim simple thing. Um, again, this 21st century, we're using weights. Weights is a static way, way of trying to correct a <laughs> dynamic system. We should look for better ways. A lot of groups are working on um, bi bionic methods of trying to develop a polymer that will contract and uh, simulate a muscle. Um, this paper came out, I think, several years ago. We haven't seen it in clinical practice. Others are working on it. Just to tell you how important the eyelid is, I am working on trying to find a transplanted muscle that will replace a, a, a paralyzed obicularis ocular. And I will talk to you a little bit more about it. So there are synthetic ways of trying to solve this problem, but I think we will get there quicker if we can find a way to transplant biologic tissues to replace biologic, biologic tissues that are non-functional. Non so if I have enough time towards the end of the talk, I'll talk to you about what I'm doing. The second thing about eye protection, besides blink, is actually corneal sensation. If you don't have good corneal sensation, you can blink or close your eyes, and your eye will still be a problem. So there are some patients that simple procedures like weights or suturing eye doesn't work, and we have to think about neurotizing the cornea again. So this is a patient that we've taken a nerve graft from the supratrochlear on the left side, tunneled it across, and we're going to innovate the uh, conjunctiva. Um, it's a very straightforward procedure. I, I usually do it with the uh, of, ophthalmologist. I have no qualms working around the eye, but it really gives me the the, the, the shakes <laughs> if I have to lift the conjunctiva up and put, but they are very comfortable with it. So if you're going to try it, you always work with them. They infiltrate the, corn, uh, the cornea, co cornea with uh, is assailing the conjunctiva lifts up, and there's a nice plane that you can finally dissect out fascicles of nerves and then just circumferentially put the nerves around it. And this is what you can get. So this is patient had um, problems on the left eye, tried all kinds of stuff. With, with innovation, you can see that the health of the cornea improves. So there are some category of patients that we have to think about. If the cornea is asensate, we can innovate and bring some sensation back. So that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing is that, you know, there are some patients you try everything, nothing works. Um, and this is a prosthesis. I'm not sure if a vulnerable offers it. It's, it's got a very uh, fancy name. I sim simply, we call it a pros. Um, it's uh, this contact lens looking thing. The co portion contacting the eye is um, the asensitive portion of the eye, and it's got fluid that constantly eludes onto the cornea. This is a, it's a godsend to me. For patients who feel everything, I go to this, and usually they think, what do you need to tell me about this area early, earlier on? The only problem with this is that um, insurance doesn't pay for it now, and it's custom made, so hopefully over time we'll, we'll see some changes. So that's what we do for the eye. Of course, there are other things that we do to the lower eyelids, and I'm not going to go over that. So putting the eye aside, you are presented with a patient with paralysis. You have to think about, with all the technologies and techniques we have, which should I choose for what? I try to like to simplify things in my, in my mind. If you see a, a nephrologist, they always think about the kidney as the end organ. In the face, as far as muscles are concerned, the facial muscles are the end organs of facial movement. So I go to the end organ, the facial muscles, and I make my decisions backwards from that. What is the status of the facial muscle? Is it physiologically active? Can it respond to an innovation? And if so, I, I work my way backwards. So if I have, I'm presented with a patient, I put them into categories, they are reversibly completely paralyzed, meaning their facial muscles are fine, 
but it can be reversed. That's as an example as someone had a parotid surgery, the nerve was cut. Before they went into surgery, the face was moving. That muscle is reversibly paralyzed. The paralysis may be complete, but it's reversible. Or a person had an acoustic neuroma, the tumor was removed, the nerve is intact, but the face doesn't move, the muscles are fine, that's a reversible paralysis. Versus the next category, complete irreversible paralysis. Someone told them that the nerve is going to recover in a year, patient was lost to follow up, they came up back to you five years later, that muscle is dead, it's gone, that is an irreversible paralysis. So whatever I'm going to do, I need a new muscle. Or the patient was born with Mobius syndrome, the facial muscles were mal malformed. That's an irreversible paralysis from the muscle standpoint. If you're going to solve that problem, you need a new muscle. So that's how I categorize uh, uh, patients. And then, of course, there's always an in-between. People who have partial paralysis or patients who have partial um, recovery. Partial paralysis, and this is a very difficult uh, situation that I'm going to explain. You have a patient with a perigenuclear tumor hemangioma or schwannoma on the facial nerve. And the patient's face is fine. And then a year later, they have a house Brachman 2 over 6. But the face is okay. But you know there's a tumor. If you take that benign tumor out, you give them complete paralysis. If you don't do anything, next year there will be 3 out of 6. The next year, 4 out of 6. What do you do? So that's a different, different category, and I'll tell you what I do for those situations. So I can categorize patients into th these three columns and then decide what I'm going to do. So let's look at um, examples of reversible complete paralysis. Okay. The problem with reversible complete paralysis is that sometimes the decision making is not so straightforward. So I'll give you a clinical scenario. Um, Dr. Rivers does um, an acoustic neuroma and tells me the tumor was infiltrating the facial nerve, so he cut the facial nerve. The decision for me is straightforward. The nerve is cut, it's not going to grow back, you need to fix it, and you need to fix it as quickly as possible. So the nerve is cut, immediate or early repair. Not, not a problem, it's a straightforward decision. He never cuts the facial nerve, so that situation will never happen, right? Okay. <laughs> the alternative route is that he tells you that I dissected the nerve nicely, the nerve is anatomically intact, it's stimulated at 0 0.5 milli. Um, at, the, uh, uh, at the end of the case, everything was great, but when the patient woke up, the face is paralyzed completely. But he reassures the patient that the nervous spine is stimulated, it will recover. So let's just wait. Patients are not uh, patient. Patients, not patient. Right? They will ask you, how long am I going to wait? Do you wait a month, six months, one year? The dogma is that you give people a year. Our studies that started with the reverse is showing that if you wait a year, it's too long. So the decision with someone who has complete paralysis but an intact nerve is very difficult, and this is what we found. We looked at a, a lot of patients. Uh, let me skip this. And here is the reverse. Looked at a lot of patients, and we realized that what actually happens during the first six months of the patient's recovery can predict what will happen long term. So if you have a patient who has an intact facial nerve but complete paralysis, and you tell them to wait 12 months, see them so often, if in the first month nothing happens, three months no recovery, six months no recovery, you can bet that if you wait 18 months, two years, nothing satisfactory would happen. So with all this group of over 200 patients, those who did not show any sign of clinical recovery within the first six months didn't have any satisfactory recovery long term. So we can predict that if I follow you clinically by six months, you are not showing any signs of recovery, I should do something, innovate your face, and not wait the do uh, uh, dogmatic 12 months. This was a uh, retrospective study. So we actually did a prospective study where I took patients who had waited, had acoustic neuroma or parotid <laughs> surgery, waited six months, showed no recovery, the facial nerves were intact, and I took them to surgery and told them, I'm going to innovate your face. In every single one of those patients, I did an intraoperative EMG. The facial nerves were exposed, so you could directly stimulate the nerve, and none of them had any movement of the facial muscle. All of them had uh, a group of uh, patients decided they wanted to go ahead, and then we innovated them. Those who refused surgery, even after 22 months, didn't show any sign of recovery. So, 
we have a group of patients who said six months, I have no recovery. I agree that you should do a nerve, nerve grafting. Those recovered very well. Well, a group of patients, I offered them surgery at six months, and they said, no, I'll wait for 12, 12 months. They didn't improve. I will wait for 18 months, they didn't improve. So what is this telling us? Clinically, if a patient with an intact facial nerve shows no signs of recovery by six months, there is no need to wait because you are not going to do them any favors. Now, I'm trying to push the envelope. If I can determine your outcome in six months, can I determine it in three months to, to really shorten, shorten the, the duration of your paralysis? So that's the summary of the paper that we, we wrote. Again, you look at this column, these patients who asked for no intervention, you can see they made no, no improvement. Okay, so you've decided that the patient's paralysis is reversible, meaning if you innovate them, they're going to recover, and you've decided that you're going to do this quite early. Which nerve are you going to use to substitute for the facial nerve that is um, injured? We have options, and commonly we use the hypoglossal nerve, which is what is the time-tested procedure. You can also borrow from the contralateral phase, which is a cross-facial seventh nerve. You can use a trigeminal nerve, particularly the masseteric nerve. All of these are going to the seventh nerve. So which one do you choose? If you were trained in a time that hypoglossal nerve was all that was done, probably that's all you're going to do. If you are now familiar with the um, uh, trigeminal nerve, that's probably what you're going to do. If you are comfortable with doing cross-facial nerves, you, you may choose that. But each of these nerve, nerves have their unique features, and you pick them based on what you're trying to get. Hypoglossal nerve gives very good tone. Why? Because the tongue is moving all the time. Human beings, we like to talk. So our tongues are moving all the time. So that's the, that's the hypoglossal nerve. So if I, for, for example, have a patient who is a public speaker, and tells me I really want my lips to be uh, even when I'm speaking in public, I may consider using a hypoglossal nerve in their, in their re-innovation. Um, the the cross-facial nerve gives you spontaneity. So when you smile, the left side is the non-paralyzed side, the right side is the paralyzed side. Because you've connected the left to the right, both sides move um, uh, together. So it gives you some spontaneity. And then the masseteric nerve is actually very good and strong for excursion, but not so good in giving you tone as when you compare it to the um, hypoglossal nerve. I checked this on myself. I did an EMG on my tongue to find out the basal firing rate of the hypoglossal nerve, and I did it on, on my um, masseter muscle to find the firing rate, and you can tell that the basal firing rate of the masseter nerve is actually lower and slower than the hypoglossal nerve. This is a study that was done only once, because taking a needle in account is not fun. But I have the data to, 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 to support it. Okay. The next thing I want to show you is that the reason that you can innovate people early without causing much of a problem is that you don't always have to cut nerves to connect them. There are different ways of co-opting nerves. One way is what we call the end to side. A true end to side is that you take a nerve that is intact, you peel off the epineurum, you create an epineural window, there is some small destruction of axons, and you connect a nerve to it, and you get collateral sprouting into the nerve that you want. So this is an end to side. So for example, if someone has a partial recovery in paralysis, and they are maybe a house brackman four out of six, and I want to upgrade them to a two out of six, I don't have to cut their facial nerve to connect any new nerve. You can create a window and connect another nerve and upgrade their sex signal. Of course, this is the time-tested end-to-end. If you really want a lot of axons growing, you cut the nerve and you connect the two nerves. This is really straightforward. You suture, you can glue it as well. Um, so the, in terms of technique-wise, that's not very com complicated. The, the other thing about intervening early without causing problems, let's say I want to bring in more nerves to this branch of the facial nerve, and I cut this, and I do an end-to-end. -end. This portion here can still be co-opted to the main branch, and if there's any absence here, they will grow back into it. I call it, I call it waste no absence. So when you're, because of these techniques, there's no reason to wait on someone's facial nerve for a year before you intervene, because you, you don't have to burn any bridges. Okay. The last thing I, 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 I want to mention about nerve connections are 
Sometimes we are going to give our patients radiation. Someone gets a parotidectomy, you're going to kind of connect nerves. If I know a patient is going to get radiation, the nerve connections that I do, I want to protect them, and I will use a vascularized nerve graft. And in my experience, they do much, much better. So those are just some principles. So let's put them all together. This is a patient who had radical parotidectomy on the right side. The fish under was completely cut. I know the nerve is cut, so I can innovate right away. I've done a vascularized nerve graft. And if you look, even after radiation, the texture of the skin, the volume of the skin, the tone and the movement is decent. So that's what vascularized nerve grafts will give you. The last thing I want to talk about nerve coaptations when it comes to the face is a lot of times you look at the patient's facial nerves, you have all these branches, and the question is, where do I connect it? Do I connect it to the main nerve, to the pest? It all depends on multiple factors, what you're trying to do. So we're gonna put all these principles together in a patient. One other thing is the masseteric nerve is not a nerve that we commonly encounter in head and neck surgery. We work on the hypoglossal nerve, accessory nerves when we do neck dissections, but masseteric nerve, I never saw it during my residency training. And, and so the first time I did a masseter nerve, I was frustrated. I dug through the masseter for, for two hours and I saw this tiny little thing and I was surprised it was going to do anything. So we went to the lab. If you draw a triangle over the sigmoid notch and you stick a needle, the needle is going to go straight to the masseter nerve. It's a very confined area. It's not difficult to do. So the triangle is defined by if you draw a line below the zygomatic arch and the vertical line in front of the temporal mandibular joint, the angle that bisects that line is where the masseter nerve is. And in that small window, you can always find the masseter nerve. So it's not something, a nerve that we commonly find, but this usually helps you there. This is an example of a patient with complete paralysis on the right and has undergone a masseter nerve transfer. The incision is very small in front of the ear. You go through the uh, subzygomatic triangle, the triangle that I just designed, and in three and a half months, eight hours, the nerve phase moves. I always tell my patients, you have to take three and a half months with eight hours, and it will, it will recover. Um, why, on average, that's how long it takes. Why, why is the masseter nerve so um, ideal? Even if the patient is going to get radiated, because the masseter nerve is so close to where you are co-opted, by the time they get to radiation, the nerve has almost grown into your distal nerve, nerve branches, and usually the recovery is very good. This is another patient who had an acoustic neuroma. The right face was totally, the nerve was totally cut in the IAC. And so within a month, I, within, within a month, I innovated the face. And you can see resting tone is not so great, but excursion is excellent for masseteric nerve. This patient is from the Middle East. She always comes back. This side is a little bit down. Can you pull it up? And I tell her, listen, your face is better than a droopy face, so just leave it alone. Okay. So that's what the masseter nerve uh, will, will do for you. Classically, the hypoglossal nerve, um, it's still a, a useful nerve. We don't do as many of those, but it has its role. There are different ways of doing the hypoglossal nerve. You can cut the hypoglossal nerve completely and transpose it to the face. I, I almost never do, I never do that because you're going to give the patient a heavy paresis of the tongue and atrophy, and, and that's wasting too, too many axons. Um, you can do a, a jump graft between the hypoglossal and the facial I tend to do that if I'm trying to recruit hypoglossal nerve plus something else. Some people will split the hypoglossal nerve and transpose it. I'm not too big of a fan of splitting because I think I'm going to cut through too many uh, accents. If I'm doing hypoglossal nerve as a standalone procedure, my preferred method is to decompress the facial nerve out of the vertical segment of the mastoid and bring the facial nerve to the hypoglossal nerve. And in that case, you, you keep the hypoglossal nerve. So here, the facial nerve has been decompressed and it's been brought and it will be connected. This is the ansa cervicalis hypoglossal facial nerve. I'm going to connect it end to side. You do about a 30% neurotomy and then you can connect it. This is an example of a patient who had uh, complete paralysis on the left side, excellent tone with hypoglossal. The only thing with hypoglossal, if the patient needs to smile, they need to move their tongue. It's not very natural to smile moving their tongue. And so I don't tend to use hypoglossal for dynamic excursion. I tend to use that, the hypoglossal that I want excellent tone around the lips. So this is something I'll do for a teacher. This is somebody I'll do for a, a, someone who is a public, public speaker. 
Okay, this is the youngest patient I ever did hypoglossal nerve on. We always still tell patients that even when we use a masseteric nerve or hypoglossal nerve, there is some plasticity. Over time, you use your tongue to smile or you clench your teeth to smile. If you keep doing it, it gets easier and easier to do. So my Beck's case example is this two-year-old. He, he had a schwannoma of the facial nerve and the nerve was cut at age two. So I did a hypoglossal nerve because that's what I used to do like 12 years ago. And that's, that's this boy. I want to put some sound. For the past few years, I've been working with Jessica Todd at Mary Bell and Speech Pathology. I've lately been working to strengthen my tongue and facial muscles. I've been working on tongue coordination and my facial expressions. For instance, my smile, you'll notice, is if I'm not concentrating, it will be asymmetrical. <laughs> However, if I am concentrating, it can be quite symmetrical. I can now use both sides of my tongue and use the tip of my tongue to move to different points along my mouth. I will shorten this. Just to say, if you do the hypoglossal, the patients become very eloquent as well. <laughs> okay. so, so, so comparing masseteric to hypoglossal, is one better than the other? Not necessarily. You pick what you're trying to gain out of it. I, we compared our results. What we see is that masseter tends to recover earlier than hypoglossal. And um, the earlier uh, um, you, you do the re re repair in both cases, the better you usually the, the result. So again, early result, pick your nerve based on what you're trying to achieve. Now, this is a patient who had hypoglossal nerve in repose, and then I, 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 with, with a smile, you see very symmetric. We, you've seen this one already. Because the, each of these nerves has its unique features, why not combine the unique features of the two to get what you want? So if, if I want a little a symmetric tone, I may do a jump graph from the hypoglossal to the facial and still connect the masseter nerve. So I get the best of two worlds. Always um, taking advantage of the um, attributes of all those nerves. So the central nerve is the seventh nerve. The hypoglossal will give us tone. Masseteric will give us um, excursion. But then, cross-facial gives us the spontaneity. You can actually take a patient, because of all the branches in the facial nerve, connect the hypoglossal, the masseter, and the cross-facial. And you will see the results coming in one after the other. First, the masseter comes in, and then the hypoglossal comes in, and then the cross-facial comes in. There is something that happens to the facial muscles. Eventually, the cross-facial will take over. For some reason, I don't think it's an additive effect. Over time, the patients stop clenching, they stop using their tongue, and they just smiles uh, more spontaneously. Okay. I was saying that I picked the next base on this, but if this patient who has, is a, more older, has a lot of laxity on the side of the face, if I do a masseter nerve transfer only, I would get excursion, but his face will always look drippy. In fact, he's already had a masseter nerve transfer. But whenever I ask him to smile, it, he can move very Talk well, but at rest, it's very okay. flaccid. Now you can relax. Give me a soft smile. Give me a big smile. Okay. And uh, try to shut your is, teeth. This is before I did anything. Okay. Showing that you can do a combination of this patient is a 25 year old with a massive schwannoma in all the branches of the facial nerve. When she came to me, her face was perfect. All we needed to do is do a biopsy and confirm that this was benign. And I told her, don't do anything to the nerve, your face is fine. You know, we can confirm that this is benign, let's just watch it. She said, I want this out of my face. I want this out of my face means you're going to do a radical resection of all the facial nerves. But I just want to show you, sometimes patients will push you, and you, you probably have to listen to them. All, this is the worst case of schwannoma of the facial nerve I've seen. Every single branch, including the frontal branch, looked like a ginger uh, a tuber really huge. So this is her right after surgery, face is completely paralyzed. This is her early on after the masseter nerve has been connected and hypoglossal nerve has been connected. I, she even got her dimple back, right? This is showing that if you connect nerves, 
multiple fascicles and you do it very early, you can get almost near normal uh, re results. This is another patient who had radical parotidectomy on the right side and we did a masseter plus a facial, a combination, trying to get uh, excursion and spontaneity. So at rest, very even. I normally don't get good for, uh, forehead elevation, but in her, we actually got good forehead elevation, excellent blink, symmetric smile. Um, this is because the result was, the repair was done very early and in using a combination of nerves. <coughs> this is another patient. I'm going to skip through some of these. This, a lot of times when we talk about cross facial nerve grafts, you are connecting the nerve, the sural nerve, from the non-paralyzed side to the paralyzed side, and it's a long distance across which the nerve has to grow. <laughs> but if you did a cross facial nerve early and alone, your result would not be good because it takes a long time for the nerves to, to grow across the face. But for some reason, when it's combined with a masseter nerve, because the masseter gets there first and the cross facial comes in later, you can get a very decent result. So this patient is a single stage masseter nerve and cross facial. This is movement from the masseter alone. And we're going to see a movement from the cross facial alone isolated. I'll skip it. One thing I want you to do is that the lips are just very, very, very even. Okay. I earlier on said that when you have a benign tumor on the facial nerve, it's a very tough decision to make because if you go and take the nerve, you're going to give them complete paralysis. But if you don't do anything, then the tumor can progress and make things worse. So in that specific case, this is what I do. A case sample is someone who has a hemangioma on the facial nerve, and you know it's benign. And they come to you, and their, their facial function is about two out of a six. What do you do? Do you just watch the hemangioma and let it continue to grow? Or do you go and take it out right away? OK. So a patient with a perigeniculate tumor compressing the facial nerve, you're watching and seeing gradual decrease in facial function. When do you intervene? Do you wait to, for them to become a house brackman three of six or four or six or five out of six? Do you wait for them to become really bad before you intervene? The answer I'm proposing is no, you don't wait. You try to intervene as early as possible. And I'll show you an example. So my hypothesis is that if you proactively or prophylactically innovate that facial nerve that is being compressed, you can arrest the progression of the facial uh, dysfunction. And then it gives you a chance to just watch the tumor and not do anything. And if the tumor should progress and get large and you decide to take it out, the face should not become completely paralyzed. So let's look at the patient. This patient presented with a house Brackman 3 out of 6 with a facial nerve tumor. And it was going to be resected. And if he's resected, his face is going to go flaccid. So I said, I'm going to innovate your face before the tumor is removed. So we innovated the face four months before the tumor was removed. And this tumor, you can see it right here. Now, this is, this is his face right in the post-operative area. And I want to show you that his facial nerve has been completely cut, but he still has movement on the left side. Why? Because the nerve was grafted four months ahead of time. So I have a cohort of patients that we have grafted facial nerves, moved, arrested people's progression of facial paralysis, and now they have a benign tumor that we are watching. Right? About five of them, we haven't taken the tumor out. In this, those patients that the tumor progresses, when you take the tumor out, as in this patient, you don't get flaccid paralysis. The facial muscles have been preserved over the period that you are watching. So it's a way to use all these nerve graft connections to prevent complete paralysis in patients who have benign tumors of the facial nerve. And this is the result from that study. We have patients who started from a uh, house Brackman 2 and we maintained it, and patients who were house Brackman 3 that we improved their, their, their function. This is an example of a patient. This patient has a, a hemangioma, a large hemangioma in the geniculate region, and this is how she presented. And we have done that signal upgrading procedure, and for the past six years, I've just watched her, her, in, her facial function has been stabilized, so we don't need to go take the tumor out. 
So in conclusion, prophylactic facial nerve grafting has a role in upgrading somebody's facial signals to allow you to either observe a benign tumor and not do a radical surgery or prepare them for radical surgery without total flaccid paralysis. Okay, so those, these are some of examples for people who are reversibly paralyzed. What if they are completely paralyzed? The muscle is gone either because they were born that way or because their paralysis is long duration uh, or the faces were radiated so the facial muscles are uh, fibrotic so they won't respond to any innovation. In those patients, in the past, these procedures have been the mainstay. You take the temporalis muscle, you flip it over the zygomatic arch, and you suspend it to the oral commissure. That, nobody does it anymore. You can take the masseter muscle, take a strip of it, and connect it to the oral commissure. That is very unsightly, because the vector is not ideal. And now there's a talk more of autodromic temporalis tendon transfer, which is the decent two-hour procedure that will give you facial suspension. That procedure works very, very well. I like it, but it's not versatile. It only gives you one vector of movement, and that's it. It has its role. The mainstay now is the use of free functional muscle transfer, which is the gracilis. I'll talk a little bit more about the gracilis, the problems with the gracilis, and what we are doing to make them better. Remember the first image that I showed you of the kid smiling? The gracilis of these days do not give us that, but that's where we are going to. So I'll show you some of the modifications that we've proposed um, to improve the gracilis. This is the autodromic temporalis tendon transfer. You, you can go, that go transoral, find a temporalis tendon, divide it from the coronoid, and then use a length tension curve, determine the ideal tension at which you need to set the face, and on the table, you can have a patient really smiling. That's the, that's the movement, and this is a right, right away two hour surgery, you can, you can develop that. This is a patient who had congenital paralysis on the left side. Okay. And this is her after temporal tendon transfer, it's early result, even, even a, a smile. This is a two hour procedure. The, the, the limitation of this surgery is it's, you don't always get this result. In some people, it's just a static suspension, in others, um, you just don't really don't get the movement. So I like it, but it's not so versatile. The versatile way of repairing a completely irreversibly paralyzed face is to find a muscle somewhere in the body and transpose it to the face. Now, there are a lot of muscles that have been tested over time, and any time we have one, more than one way of doing something, it means none of them is excellent, right? Our preference and probably the most common way of doing this is using the gracilex muscle. You look at the size of the muscle, the fiber type, the penation, the force that it can generate, and the, the pedicle caliber to pick the muscle that you want. So again, the gracilis is the mainstay, and usually you try to make it get a small muscle, and then you pick a nerve to, as we've already described, to innovate that gracilis muscle. My preference is to use two nerves to innovate the gracilis muscle, as we've always talked about. This is the gracilis muscle, this is the obturator nerve, Commonly, we will use the masseter nerve as an end-to-end, -end, and then a cross-facial nerve as an end-to-side. We do this procedure either as a two-stage procedure or a one-stage procedure. I will tell you that a two-stage procedure usually begins with a sural nerve recruiting axons from the control lateral side of the face, so that the nerve grows across the face to the paralyzed side, usually six months to one year. And then the second stage, you transpose the muscle. I have done a lot of single-stage cross facial obturator as a one stage surgery and I can't tell the difference between the two. So I've stopped doing two stage procedures. I do some, what am I trying to say? There is something about connecting a muscle nerve to a muscle that it just prepares the muscle that the cross facial will come in and it still works. So I'm moving away, I'm not really seeing a difference between my two stage cross facial gracilis versus a single stage cross facial gracilis. So I spare patients two procedures. Okay, this is the face we are trying to achieve, with the smile we are trying to achieve with the gracilis. That's asking, asking a lot from a single muscle. But there are certain things that would push us towards this area. You want to make sure that the muscle glides easily. So when you're doing your dissection, you want to prevent scarring. You don't want too much bulk. If you look in the textbooks, you see a gracilis muscle, and when they smile, it looks like they are chipmunks. It doesn't look good, right? 
you have to get the ideal vector, and I'll talk to you uh, about it. You want the muscle to generate enough force to move the face. You want it to be very spontaneous, so when they smile, there's no lag in the facial movement, and, and you target the way you put, you put the muscle in, okay? Usually we are trying to get a very slim, slender muscle. This is the tendinous portion of the gracilis. This is the pedicle and this is the obturator nerve. If you put a small muscle in the face, you don't get so much bulk. Again, this is a dynamic pro uh, 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 process. So you just don't put the muscle in. You want to generate this curve, and usually we can sort of test the muscle in intra of and see how much it moves so we can tell how much tension we should put on it. There is a device that we are working on that allows us to put a needle in the muscle and be able to scan and see the sacromial length of the muscle so that when you insert the muscle, you can push it back to its original um, state so you get the optimal um, uh, co contraction. So let's apply the gracilis to restore a smile. Initially, I told you the smile is probably the, the most, um, uh, the emotional symbol that we have that has a lot of positivity to it. And so that's why most of these surgeries are geared towards improving smile. This is a kid with Mobius that I met in, um, grass, um, in Peru. There were a bunch of kids and I told them, you know, you tell patients, smile for the camera. I had forgotten that they were Mobius kids. They couldn't really smile. This kid, this is what he did. He did it so naturally, you could tell he's been doing it many, many years. What am I telling you? If you lose the ability to smile, you do everything to, to smile. So if you have the ability to smile, please smile a lot, okay? So th this is a good example uh, on, on how, what it takes to smile. When, when you see a good smile, there is something about it. You can count teeth on both sides. There is what we call the um, dental display. You see the scaffolds of the gingiva, and the commissures are moved almost symmetrically. So this is what I call the anatomy of a smile. So if I'm going to use a gracilis to try to recreate a smile, I'm trying to get dental display. I want the gingiva to show. I want the lip to be elevated evenly. I want the commissures to be symmetric. This is what should guide how we do a gracilis muscle. So let's look at um, different types of smile. What we do get with the procedures that we have are the Mona Lisa smile. The Mona Lisa smile doesn't make me happy. I mean, it, it, it gives... Um, Tourists, a lot of pleasure to go watch it, but that Mona Lisa smile doesn't engender any positivity to it. Most of the gracilis, this is my result from many years back. I was very thrilled with it because the patient went from here to a symmetric uh, commissure, and when you ask her to smile, the corners of the mouth will move very well, and I'm happy this is a really good result. This is a Mona Lisa smile. There is nothing positive about it. It's not like the first smile I showed you. So although we are satisfied with this, we need to push the envelope to try to move from here to the little kid that I showed. This is another patient with a um, brainstem tumor. Moves from here to there. I'm very happy with it, but this is a Mona Lisa smile. There's no teeth showing. It doesn't show me that this is a very happy kid. Are we satisfied? I'm, I'm thrilled. The patient is very happy, but we need to move beyond that. So I'm gonna show you what the things that we're we doing to try to move to beyond that. Another Mona Lisa smile, asymmetric. You have to smile, no teeth showing, good result, but not that positive emotional uh, smile that we want. So Mona Lisa, very popular for that smirk that she has on the face, but it's not the type of smile we want to recreate. The Duchenne smile is the enjoyment smile. I want to see all these bad teeth as long as they are white. I want to see the eye narrow out and become thin. You want to see the cheeks mount up. You want to see the lips positively elevated. This is the picture we have in the mind to try to uh, recreate a smile. The gracilis flap, as currently described, is incapable of doing this consistently. So we need to modify our technique. Again, this is the, the, the face we're trying to look. To do so, we have to try to rip, 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 uh, replace most of the muscles that move the lip. So if you look at the lip, there are multiple muscles, the ones that move the uh, commissure in this vector, and there are those that elevate the lip in almost a straight ve vertical vector. So it's a multiple vertical uh, vector approach to um, moving the lip to recreate a smile. So we are moving from a univector gracilis flap that just moves the commissure to a multiple vector flap that moves the lip to recreate a more complete smile. 
Why can we do that? Because if you use, look at the vascularity of the um, gracilis muscle, it's got this parallel architecture of vessels and nerves, so it allows us to take a muscle and split them into multiple muscle fascicles and distribute them in, in various vectors. So we are moving from a univector gracilis to a two-vector gracilis or even to a three-vector gracilis so we can approach a more Duchenne type of smile. So usually if I have a left-sided paralysis, I will go to the right side and take a muscle and then split them into two, dissecting through the fascicles to find vessels and nerves so I can have one vector here, a second vector here, or sometimes three, one, two, three, to recreate a more complete smile. So this is a two paddle, two vector gracilis valve. On, on the table, you can see that the primary muscle paddle is, is moving, and if independently you stimulate the second one, you can see contraction of the secondary paddle. The two muscle paddles, it's like a chimeric flap, they can move independent of each other, and we can usually recreate different vectors to get a smile that lifts the upper lip and shows me a full teeth as in the Duchenne type of smile. We extend the flap all the way to the eye so that the eye can also squint when they smile. So that when you're, you're, we're trying to recreate a full smile. So this is a patient with complete paralysis, irreversible on the left side because of the duration. And I did a multi-vector gracilis flap. So this is her before the surgery and this is her after surgery. And you can see complete upper lip elevated, full teeth showing, eye trying to squint. This is a much better smile than the first ones that are. Uh, you look at her and she is uh, projecting more positive positivity than. So, help me walk up. so I had the surgery in January, and a few months later, I could feel that there was some movement in the upper part of my face. So she didn't have and a cross facial. She's just a master of course. She refused a cross facial. She's exuding more positivity compared to the first picture video that I showed you where her face was sad. Showing more teeth, having the lips elevate, cheek mounts up, eyes squinting, much better than the Mona Lisa smile. And when we analyze, we can tell the number of dental display uh, has improved, the commercial position has improved, labial elevation has improved. That's what a multi vector gracilis will do. This is another patient with a right side paralysis for over 20 years because of surgery that was done when she was very young. Half smile, big smile. Okay, show me your lower bottom teeth. Okay, so let's skip this. And so this is her complete upper lip elevation, equal dental show, cheek mounts, eye looks smaller. So that's what a multi vector smile would do. Okay. This is another patient. I'm going to skip through this. This patient had osteosarcoma, extensive scarring on the left side of the face, tissues wouldn't move, multi-vector um, um, gracilis. Even with the scarring, really tight. you can see the lips are, uh, are even. Wrinkle your nose. And we have a more fuller smile on the left side. This patient had a stroke, everything on the left side paralyzed, a more fuller smile, labial elevation, Full dental show, cheek mounts, much better than we have uh, um, done it. Another patient, similar on the right side. A more fuller smile, dental show. So the multi-vector allows us to be more versatile, better than a, a, a unilateral, and gives us more a closer approach to a more enjoyable smile than the. Um, uh, classic gracilis. Looking at about 15 patients, this paper will be published soon. It's showing in all categories in terms of its, uh, symmetry, it's improved. Ginger, gingival scaffold show improved. The number of uh, uh, dentition uh, ex exposed going from an average of 5.5 to 8.60 being showed, shown. So overall, the multi vector more versatile than the classic um, gracilis part. I told you on my earlier slides, one of the first things we do in reanimation is to try to fix the eye. We are, we are using old school to just put a weight in the eyelid. What we really want is a dynamic way of fixing the eyelid, and that's what I, I will end, end on. Is there a muscle that we can actually put in the eyelid that will replace opicularis oculi muscle? 
instead of depending on biopolymers? And the answer is maybe so. So the omohyoid, if you've done a nerve dissection, it's a very tiny muscle, it's a resident's friend, we cut it, we discard it. To me, any time I enter an OR and there's a neck dissection, they always say, oh, here it comes. Cover the omohyoid, because I want to see the omohyoid, right? I've been doing omohyoid, um, studying the omohyoid muscle as a potential flower for facial reanimation for the past six years. And I have some clinical examples to show. The questions I had is, can we actually take the omohyoid as a free flap, meaning a muscle, a tendon, a nerve, an artery, and vein? If we can, is the pedagogy reliable that we can connect and get that muscle to be vascularized? If so, can that omohyoid generate enough force to move the face? So that was the um, study that I embarked on and using multiple uh, methods. First, going to the cadaver uh, lab and dissecting the omohyoid muscle out you'll find that it's pedicle on the superior thyroid artery and vein, and the nerve is the ansa, an, ansa cervicalis. So yes, you can have it as a neovascular uh, flap, and this is the omohyoid muscle with the pedicle. This is the omohyoid muscle as well. It, so I will always go into, into the OR, oh, look at the neck dissections, trying to define all the areas that the nerve to the omohyoid goes. It's not uh, singular, it's got a uh, diverse anatomy, but working your way from the muscle, you can consistently find the nerve to the omo omohyoid. The next is to say, is the pedicle reliable? So using the spy technique, we find out that reliably is through the superior uh, thyroid artery, and it's well perfused. So you put a dye and you can spy it, and it's really well perfused. And, and if so, can we actually take it in a real patient? And this is the first omohyoid flap that I did. Very small muscle comparing this to a gracilis muscle. This muscle is comparable to most of the facial muscles. If you put the omohyoid muscle side by side to the zygomaticus major, it's about the same size. Okay, so we were able to answer the question, yes, it can be harvested as a free flap. Yes, it's got a, a reliable neurovascular pedicle. The last one was, can it generate enough force? And the answer is actually yes. So I took omohyoid muscles and just did length excursion um, measurements. And on average, it, it moves about 1 to 1.5 centimeters. And if you can find the cross-sectional area of a muscle, you can ca calculate the force that it generates. And for about 10 uh, omohyoids, we did that. And you compare it to the other facial muscles, you see that it actually can generate more force than the zygomaticus major muscle. So the omohyoid muscle is actually a good candidate for a free flap muscle. So the next is, let's try it in the patient. So omohyoid can be harvested as a free flap. It's got enough force, the pedicle is reliable. This is the first, so this is zygomaticus major. This is omohyoid, similar size. The first patient that I did was a patient with melanoma. Had a through and through defect where all the muscles have been cut, including the um, the lining, the buccal mucosa. Um, he was having a neck dissection, so it was an ideal patient. I could harvest the omohyoid in the neck because there's an incision, and I could replace the um, cut facial muscle. Of course, I had to repair the defect as well. I used an ALT to create a lining and for external coverage, and I used the omohyoid to replace the zygomaticus major muscle. So this is the omohyoid muscle. ALT is in there, create covering the lining, and the omohyoid muscle is here. And this is the patient um, and to show the, show the movement that he recovered. The recovery of facial function was in six weeks compared to four, five, six months in another in patient. And there's a very good commercial elevation from the omohyoid muscle. So this told me, yes, you know, the omohyoid muscle can be taken as a small muscle and doesn't put bulk in the face. Well. It can compete with the gracilis, but I want to do more with it. I started this section talking about what can we do with the eye. It just happens to be that if we want a dynamic movement for the eyelid, we need a muscle around it. We need a muscle that would simulate the prepapibral orbital portion of the orbicularis. So that's what we want to do with the omohyoid muscle. So I've asked a lot of patients, uh, people in the audience, what muscle is this? And the answer I get is the orbicularis oculoid muscle. I'm giving you a hint, this is actually the omohyoid muscle. It replaces it almost perfectly. So in about two weeks, I'm gonna do my first clinical case. 
replacing a, a paralyzed omohyoid um, orbicularis with omohyoid muscle. The, the point here is that you can connect the pedicle to the contralateral side, hook it up to this branch that goes to the eye. So when the eye blinks on the good side, it potentially will blink on the paralyzed side. If the ipsilateral nerves are available, you can do that. The pedicle can reach the masseter nerve. So if I don't have an option for facial nerve, I can connect it to the, to the masseter nerve. Okay, so this is another issue. This is indeed omohyoid with a pedicle that can go to contralateral side or uh, ipsilateral side. So omohyoid is an ideal replacement for the uh, orbicularis, and hopefully we will move away from just relying on passive loading or static loading of the eyelid to a more dynamic um, correction of the eyelid. So in summary, we have nerves that we can connect in combination and do them early to try to restore facial movement. There are muscles that can be done and tweaked to give us a more fuller um, uh, smile. Thank you for your attention. I'll take questions.